Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and we're in day two of the 2015 Global Education Conference, the sixth year of this conference, with our good friend Dana Mortensen. Welcome, Dana. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Lucy. I know you're on, too. It's a real honor to be with everybody today. We appreciate you being here. Thanks to our sponsors and supporters. We are so grateful for such a great group of organizations that have helped to make this conference possible. We appreciate them and hope that you will find some way to connect with them or at least check out their websites. This is an opportunity now for you to indicate where you're participating from in the world. Look to the left of the map for the star icon. Click on it, it'll open out, click on the star again, and then click on the map. Some of you know the drill here. Put your name and, well, your name is there, but put your location and time or temperature in the chat if you'd like. Well, this is a very North America-centric audience. Lone India. So keep those locations going in the chat, but I'm going to move us forward here for a second. Dana Mortensen is co-founder and executive director of World Savvy. She's dedicated her professional life to educating and engaging youth in community and world affairs, to closing the global competence gap in American education, her deep belief in the transformative power of global education to contribute to peace, justice, and equity on a global scale led her to co-found World Savvy in 2002. She has since led the organization through extensive growth and expansion, reaching more than 405,000 students and 3,000 educators from three offices nationwide. Dana is a recognized expert in the field of global education and serves as an advisor and board member to a range of nonprofits focused on international education and youth development. She's a frequent speaker on the subject of global citizenship and social entrepreneurship. She's a 2011 Ashoka Fellow, recipient of the Jane Bagley Lehman Award for Public Advocacy, and was named one of the New Leader Council's 40 Under 40 Progressive American Leaders in 2010. She holds a BA in International Relations from Connecticut College and a Master's in International Affairs from the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. Dana, welcome again, and thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. And I just wanted to say first, um, thanks to Lucy and Steve for arranging what really is a gargantuan task, bringing the whole world together to talk about global ed. And also to all of you who are with me today, um, it's really exciting to be among so many colleagues, and especially in a week like the one we're having, where um, we've certainly um, been grappling with some pretty complex challenges and grieving and trying to understand how to move through um, as a, as a global community, and so I think it's um, a really a really great time to be talking about global competence um, and what we can do together. So thank you. I see a lot of colleagues in the list. Iron. I see fellow colleagues from World Savvy. So thanks for being here. And we'll um, invite any of my World Savvy colleagues to answer questions in the chat um, section if I miss them as we go through. Um, so it's great to be with you today. What I'm planning on doing is talking a little bit about the context for uh, teaching and learning with global competence. So giving people, many of you on this, um, on the, in the conference already have a sense of the need for global competence, but giving you a sense of sort of the three anchors that we pivot around when we think about how the world is changing, um, and then to talk a little bit about some examples of how, what does that look like for us in our programs when it's grounded in student practice. And then finally, um, ending by looking at some of the effective principles across student engagement, um, teacher capacity and administration. Um, I want to say in advance, I know it looks like we've got a fairly North American centric group, but a lot of the statistics that I'm using in the Y are grounded in demography and other things that are US centric. Um, 
And so I want to acknowledge that up front. Um, but the sentiment and the sort of the, the, the trends that I'm sharing are, are hold pretty constant across other countries and regions. So I just want to acknowledge that in the beginning and ask you to bear with me for that reason. Um, I think before I dive into the discussion, I thought it would be useful to know why and how my own narrative became a part of my work in global competence. And so what you're looking at now is a picture of my uh, friend um, and, and the woman who became my co-founder, Madiha Murshed. Uh, Madiha is Bangladeshi. She grew up uh, throughout the Mideast, went to high school in Singapore, and then came to the U.S. to attend college. Um, and I met uh, Madiha in graduate school in 2000 when we were both studying international affairs. And I was immediately drawn to Madiha um, primarily because of her worldview. It seemed so effortlessly global. Um, Medea could move through different groups of people, different cultures, make connections between history and contemporary events with such incredible ease. She really um, was so at home in the world wherever, wherever she found herself, and I admired that. And her worldview had a really big impact on me, and so we became quite close. And in the fall of our second year of graduate school, um, on the morning of September 12, 2001, we woke up to a world that was irrevocably changed from the events of 9-11, the acts of terrorism. Um, you know, not unlike in some ways what people are feeling around the world this week. And in that, as the world grieved and mourned and sort of came together to find ways to move through that tragedy, there was also um, another narrative um, at play, and that was um, a xenophobic backlash that was affecting people like my friend Madiha because she was Muslim. So she was called a terrorist, um, kicked in the shins. Um, she was um, sort of treated in a way that as someone who was born in this area and, and, and loved the city of New York and um, felt very proud to be an American, but also very conscious of um, the backlash of what hate could spurn and, and, and how fear could become contagious, um, was, was really ashamed. And so in the, in the wake of that, uh, Madiha was quite empathetic and turned a lot of our conversations into contemplations really about how we in the United States, but all over the world, um, how our communities help young people develop their worldview. So we explored that through the lens of education. Madiha's mother started the first um, private school in Bangladesh post-independence, um, and she now just opened another small school, um, and I'm the daughter of a, of a teacher as well. And so education as the platform and the leveler, the place where people could build a worldview that, was, that anchored them in the world as it was and as it would change and be. And so I offer this story as an entry point to talking about global competence, which is I know the reason we're all convening this week. Um, and, and its relevance to teaching and learning, uh, precisely because it's personal. I think um, for the very many things that global competence represents, and we are talking about them this week, we'll be hearing about some of those things um, today in this keynote, um, it really begins with something profoundly personal. I think our own narratives, where we're from, where we've been, where we're going, um, our understanding of that and how it evolves over time, um, and how it relates to experiences and people outside ourselves is what's really critical. So that self-examination um, is, is important. And so I offer that as a way to help us all have that personal lens as we dive in. Um, so the really big question at hand for us and for World Savvy and for me and my work, and I know for most of us here in this, in this conference, is that though we know our reality is becoming more global, wherever we are, the really important question is what does preparation for that future look like? Um, what will it mean for young people to thrive in 10 and 20 and 30 and in 50 years? And what kinds of skills and dispositions and knowledge base is going to be essential for that purpose? So what I'd like to do is walk through three of the ways that we anchor our understanding of how the world is changing. And again, for those just joining, um, forgive that these are anchored largely in um, statistics that pertain to the U.S. but have um, have relevance, obviously, outside those trends of the same. Um, so I want to take a look at um, the first most basic question, which is who we are. And in the United States, as we consider um, our demography, just what is the makeup of, of who lives in the United States, to give a little bit of a glimpse of how that's changed. So this is the United States um, demogra demographic in uh, 1970. So 88% white. A lot of the ethnic and cultural groups that are now thriving were um, not even measured on the census. And so um, a fairly homogenous viewpoint. If you fast forward 40 years to 2010, that changes pretty significantly. Um, the white population declines to 75%. Black and Hispanics are represent 12% each. 
um, and other ethnicities are now accounted for. So we're seeing more of, of the richness demographically that the country has. Now, the projections for 2050 um, for all of these census geeks, and many of you know this very well, um, is quite different. It's almost a complete turnaround. So it's a collective majority. For the first time, um, we won't have any single ethnic or cultural group that comprises a majority in the United States. And this is a pretty profound shift um, to the way things have been. Um, and this isn't just happening. The interesting piece of this is that it's not just happening in Texas, California, New Jersey, um, New York, the usual suspects where immigration has been sort of a longstanding tradition and it's been very, very common to the experience. It's happening in Utah, it's happening in North Dakota, Minnesota, it's happening in Indiana, in Colorado, in places where um, that's traditionally um, immigration and migration had not influenced the population in quite such a, such a, um, um, such a enormous way. Um, so, oh, just got a beep. We're still good. Um, so I think what we need to consider about this demographic shift, and for the population under 18, it's worth noting that they're already there. Most urban public school districts in the United States already have a demography that looks like this projection in 2050. And so the question is, for, for global that used to feel far away, separated by borders, that used to imply some need to understand something far away or another, it really is next door. It's our neighborhoods, our classrooms, our workplaces, communities, um, wherever we're living. So that's a significant, that's, that has significant implications for what it means to learn. Um, the second thing that we consider and think a lot about is, is really in this new reality, in this new more global interconnected reality, what does it mean to work? Um, and I think in the last um, 10 years, we've had a shifting and evolving conversation about workforce readiness. Um, I think that's a moving target when most of the constants within um, the global knowledge economy, the constant really is change. And so um, what we know now is that one in five jobs in the U.S. Um, have to do right now is inextricably linked to international trade. Um, one of the really great resources I'll point out for those of you who may not be aware of it is mappingthenation.net. And so wherever you are in the United States, you're able to literally see down to the county level um, how, how, how your county is linked to the global economy um, and international trade specifically. And so we know this is happening almost everywhere. And so really what's ahead of us is this idea of preparing young people for jobs that don't exist with technologies that haven't been invented. Um, I'll put the link right in here as I go. It's mappingthenation.net. There we go. Um, mapping the nation. Yeah, sorry. Um, to solve problems we don't even know are problems. So. When you think about the implication of that and as it applies to workforce preparation and we think about college and career and civic readiness, um, that's a profound statement. What does career readiness look like when we have no idea really truly um, um, what that looks like, napping the nation? Lucy, I do want to create the, the app Napping the Nation. I think we all could probably use it. Um, so in thinking about that workforce readiness, um, a couple of things to consider. 65% of today's grade schoolers will hold jobs that don't yet exist. 90% of the world's data has been generated in the last two years. And then just to look historically at the pace of change in terms of how information is coming to us and coming to our young people, the pace of that. So in 1900, human knowledge doubled every 100 years. By 1945, it was doubling every 25 years. By 2014, doubling every 13 months. And in 2020, it will double every 12 hours. It's estimated that right now, one week of the New York Times contains more information than a person living in the 18th century came across in a lifetime. So for those of you thinking about this, this sense of when I was in middle school, and, and perhaps many of you in this um, talk when you were in middle school, it's, um, it's .NET. Uh, NET, Lucy, on mapping the nation. Um, when we were in middle school, we had educators who delivered content to us. I got it at, um, I either got it in, in the classroom from my teacher or from around the dinner table, or I had to go to the library. Um, and the difference now is outstanding. Everyone who's teaching knows that any piece of content or information that can be provided to a student can be checked, rechecked, changed, updated, and modified by the time they hit the classroom door. So this has significant implications. Um, 
What it means about where we are is that technical knowledge isn't nearly as highly prized. And what employers are coming around to look at is what can graduates do with that knowledge, critical and creative thinking, the ability to navigate change and ambiguity. Um, global HR studies are actually looking at um, the most critical thing that employees will need, that graduates will need, is the capacity to be retrained. And so knowing that and thinking about how careers long ago had people staying, my mom's job, which she was there for 25 years, how different that is now and how different it's going to be. Um, so just to look at some of the things that are disruptors. Um, right now, this is just a few, these are just a few of the things that, are, that have come onto the landscape in the last 10 years but they're going to make jobs very different. It'll make the experience, not just the workforce different, but literally how we live our life. So driverless cars, um, flying drones. There's, I, can, I can't guarantee but would predict that we will all have a pizza delivered by drones sometime in the next couple of decades. Um, 3D printers and contour crafting. We now have the capacity for to literally 3D print buildings. Um, that technology exists. Artificial intelligence, mass energy storage, and robots. And so some of these disruptors in our system are generating these sorts of jobs. So things that don't yet exist, vertical farmers, um, individuals who do atmospheric water, water harvester, harvesting, um, extracting water from the air, drone traffic um, optimizers, crowdfunding specialists. These are all some of the things and a small list of what's happening. Um, and have and, and one of the comments I see in the thread is around the number of jobs. It is true, I think it's Yvonne that mentioned that it is true that um, the average number of jobs is actually um, increasing for people who graduate. So they're more likely to move um, between, job, between jobs. Um, the implication on relationships is one thing to consider. But what it does stress is this capacity for training and retraining, both on the part of the employer, but also on the part um, of the employee. So, um, so in thinking about workforce development, this has major implications. Um, so I want to think about, outside of those three things, a couple of the type of questions that we know um, students are going to have to grapple with. And really what, what is characterized by the type of challenges that they're dealing with. So we have, we have this sense of um, demography changing. We have a sense of the workforce changing. And now we have a sense of the kinds of problems that young people are going to face that are completely different. Different in the sense that many of them are still 100-year-old problems but that they now tend to be borderless, that they tend to involve multiple actors and be things that can't be solved by um, one single individual, one single nation state, that era is gone. It's an era of unprecedented collaboration and cooperation. And so I just want to zoom in on two of the kinds of issues and the, what they introduce, the kinds of things students will have to grapple with. And so the first is global migration. This is hard to miss. Um, this is something that um, everybody in this conference is probably very aware of. The people are on the move, unquestionably. So this is just a look at 75% of human movement um, just in the five-year period between 2005 and 2010. Um, and of course, over the, from 1990 to 2013, we saw an enormous increase, 154 million to 232 million. Huge implications on a number of levels. Right now, particularly in Syria and the broader Middle East, um, we're seeing one of the largest um, um, human migration efforts since post-World War II. So this is a, an, enormous, an enormous impact on um, communities around the world, particularly now in Europe. But this isn't a trend that's going to um, sort of decrease. It's not, it's not on the decline in any way. And in fact, what we know about migration is that particularly as a result of climate and rising sea levels, um, the numbers that are anticipated, climate refugee numbers, um, will dwarf anything that we've seen to date. And so thinking about, um, you know, dealing with this particular um, issue in the context of places where there really wouldn't be any hope of returning people to home countries. So the complexity of this kind of issue, even what it's applied in its various political, economic, social, and ethical contexts, are even are going to be even more pronounced for future generations. Um, and our graduates are going to be grappling with the policy and practice of that on an individual and on um, a collective level. The other example that I want to look at, and, and both of these examples are, are things that we like to pull into class to talk a lot about um, how students get, their, get sort of sticky with this material and really investigate it. Water is another one of these sort of entrenched, complex um, uh, issues that students will be grappling with. 
Right now in the United States, almost every state west of the Rockies has been facing a water shortage. This is obviously an issue globally, but this looks at the case of what's happening in the U.S. Um, most of California is experiencing uh, extreme to exceptional drought, so this just shows the progression over the last several years. And the crisis is in its fourth year. Um, state officials announced the first uh, cutback to farmers' water rights since 1977, and there's been a call for cities and towns to cut their water use by 36%. Um, so this drought shows no sign of letting up in California. The state's agricultural industry is suffering, and it cost the economy in the state of California last year uh, $2.7 billion alone um, this year, in 2015 alone, and we're not even through with that. The Colorado River Basin, also a water issue, um, is a different kind of an issue. Um, this supplies water for seven states, including California, and it's a sort of a slower-burning catastrophe. So it's in its 16th year. Uh, Wyoming, Colorado, New Mexico, Utah, Nevada, Arizona, and California all get water from the Colorado River Basin. It supplies water to more than 40 million people. It sustains them and, and supports about 15% of the entire United States food supply. So about 100 years ago, when officials divvied up the rights to the Colorado River nearly, it was nearly a century ago, century ago it was a wetter period than usual. Um, and so they vastly overestimated the continued supply of water that would be in the Colorado River Basin. So today, when the rivers are especially low, all seven of these states still claim what they used to claim. Um, and that amounts to about a 1.4 trillion um, gallons per year in oversubscription. That's how short we are um, in getting water from the Colorado River Basin at this point. And this is really uh, similar to California, where historic Water rights gave farms first rights to um, California streams and rivers, and it didn't really adjust as towns and cities grew. So what makes this kind of a water issue particularly challenging is that um, we don't all, we're not all equal when it comes to water um, in the U.S. So every state has its own laws in the United States about who gets how much water. It doesn't have anything to do with a formula relating to, relating to uh, property tax or anything of that nature. Um, water law is pretty arcane and confusing, but the underlying rule was essentially the first people to show up were the first people to get it, and most other people took, took a back seat. Um, so this is called prior appropriation, and it's still sort of the law of the land in Western um, water issues in the United States, even 100 years later. So this is obviously um, really problematic, but it's also emblematic of the complexity of this issue. This water issue has environmental, political, social economic um, aspects to consider, but it also has these ethical, moral, human rights implications. So we've got, uh, we've got young people who are, who are going to have to increasingly decide that when there's a scarcity of a basic human need, how do you mitigate that fairly? Um, so both of those situations, migration and water, are, are situations that are going to be at the forefront of community um, and public life and discourse for graduates. So graduates in 2035 are going to have to think about that as they leave the classroom and find ways to navigate through it. And as educators, what we need to think so critically about is the kinds of humans that we want to bear that responsibility. So beyond understanding the historical context, um, the factual framing for issues like that, um, it's, it's balancing the ethical and the moral and the social and political impacts of their choices. And so it's no, it's no small task, and um, it's one that we think a lot about when we're thinking about the future of education and pre preparing for that world. Um, so World Savvy uses um, a global competence matrix. I will send the full link. Um, this would be animated if we were in another format. Um, so these slides will not be animated, but if you want to follow along. Um, that essentially sets our understanding of the world in a few core concepts. Um, the notion that, the world, that world events are complex, that they're interdependent, um, that our own culture and history is really key to understanding um, our relationship to others, that the current world is shaped by history and historical forces, um, and that there are multiple conditions that are ultimately affecting diverse outcomes. So these are sort of, our, you know, how we frame our understanding of the world before we talk about the skills and values um, and attitudes and behaviors that comprise what it means to be globally competent. Um, this, by the way, was developed in cooperation with Teachers College, Columbia University, and Asia Society. Um, so the first to look at and think about is just um, the values and attitudes that it implies. These will all look very familiar to everyone on this call who works in this field. Um, an openness to new opportunities and ways of thinking, engaging with others, 
self-awareness, not just being um, understanding that other perspectives exist, but really valuing them. Um, comfort with ambiguity and change, um, a reflection on the context of our lives, um, really a questioning of, of assumptions that we encounter, um, and being adaptive and, and cognitively nimble. Um, empathy and humility are enormously important um, when we think about values and attitudes and how they figure into um, global competence. Um, skills are the other piece that we look at. Um, so investigating the world by framing questions, analysis, synth synthesis, um, using relevant evidence, and importantly, um, making sure that questions lead to further questions. Um, and this is something that when we look at this in the context of our teaching practice and what happens inside the classroom and discourse in the classroom, that is really critical. Um, understanding how to articulate and apply our, um, our understanding of different perspectives. Um, uh, communicating appropriately. This includes in our matrix, it's a question that comes up quite frequently, um, the capacity to communicate in multiple languages. So even though it isn't separated in this, um, our, our understanding is that, um, that that is part of what it means to be able to be conversant as a 21st century global citizen. Um, active engagement in inclusive dialogue, digital technology, resiliency, and critical and comparative thinking. Um, and finally, um, behaviors. Um, so what, what I think about when I think about um, detailing sort of how these things function in an interconnected way is the first bullet really draws this out, um, seeking out and applying an understanding of different perspectives. So it is one thing for young people, for us, um, but, but it's also another thing for young people to know, to understand their own perspective, to know that other perspectives exist, um, and to value those perspectives, but it's a wholly different um, enterprise to seek them out when you know they're missing from a conversation. So it's the sort of the interconnectedness of all these things um, that, that we believe makes for global competence, and that's sort of how we build programming around that. Um, many of the rest of these will be incredibly familiar to you all. You'll note, too, that throughout each of the values, skills, and behaviors, reflection is a constant theme. So, um, Global competence isn't an endpoint, it's a journey. Um, it's something that's dynamic, it's something that's fluid, it's something that changes. This definition will change, our understanding of what it means will change. And so um, the idea to resist um, global competence as a checklist is, is embedded in our understanding of it, that reflection is really critical and key. Um, so with that in mind, I wanna take a couple of examples, put a finer point on this, and sort of share a few things that have happened through our work um, that, that emphasize um, elements of, of global competence and point out what was happening in the classroom and what teachers were reinforcing to make that work. Um, the first is empathy, which I think is really at the core. Um, and again, not an unfamiliar thing for so many of you global educators in, in the room right now. Um, this idea of developing the ability for perspective taking and refining that. And so um, in St. Paul, um, I can just describe the, the work that we're doing there. In St. Paul, um, Minnesota right now, 40% of the um, students in the district are English language learners. So um, 126 languages are spoken. And this has been um, a rather rapid um, diversification of the population over the last two decades, considering how homogenous the population was prior. So um, during, despite the rapid demographic shifts in the district, um, there, the curriculum hadn't, hasn't changed very much um, in world history over the last couple of decades. So like many districts, there's sort of a traditional approach, linear approach um, to teaching. Um, and there's a situation where the learner profile had changed pretty significantly over the past couple of year, uh, decades, but the approach to engaging learners has not um, changed significantly. And this is something I want to say is um, that we see as a pretty common experience. Um, Education K-12 is slow to change, but the reality is our student population, our learners, are their reality is changing much faster. And so this is a big issue for a lot of districts that we find. So, so one of the things that we did um, is to work with um, ninth grade world history teachers who are trying a new approach. So rather than trying the same content in the same format, trying to pivot around empathy and building students' I, I abilities to identify multiple perspectives, um, as a way of learning the content. And so um, many of these students shared this common thread um, in their narratives, being English language learners and recent immigrants. And so we worked to create uh, a lot of these case studies that would cover the required content, but gave them space to see the material through a lens that was intensely personal. And so their own lived histories and experiences could be there. 
So one of the case studies revolved around the Soweto uprisings in South Africa, um, which revolved around the imposition of Afrikaans as the language of instruction in school, um, where students had been learning in their home languages and dialects before this shift. And so the case study was designed to hit on something most world history teachers have to look at, which is colonialism, um, looking at the social, political, cultural, and economic impacts of colonialism but gave them a lens that was very familiar to them, um, learning in a language that is not native. Um, so to understand how students were building empathy, they were tracking exit tickets twice a week um, to see how their perspectives changed and how they were connected to this material and making connections to other material. So a couple of things that were happening here were that um, case studies were being used to create very sticky, very specific context for something much larger and really, and really complex. Colonialism is a complex. Um, multi-layered topic to address and to tackle. Um, it was allowing students to see the issue through the perspective of people who were most impacted in a very personal way, and then allowing student space to find um, parallels to their own narrative. And then it was placing empathy um, alongside, um, alongside colonialism, the content that we wanted to teach, as equally important. So they were developed concurrently in a way that had real root and meaning there. So. Um, so that's what, what was happening there. And Yvonne, I see your um, comment on K-5 case studies. I think we can we can help you with that as well. We're actually modifying this um, case studies for use at grade three um, as we speak, and so happy to share some of those with you offline. Um, the second example I want to look at is ingenuity. And so one of the things that that I think all of us have heard have heard so often is you know the potential of young people um, to to problem solve and change the world. And and what we need to be thinking about is to stop sort of using um, a tense that implies that that's a future-facing endeavor. Um, students are problem solvers now. Um, they're engaged deeply in learning when they have the opportunity um, to tackle problems now and to think in a solution-oriented lens about them. And so one of the best examples that um, comes to mind when I think about this is a, a young man in Oakland, California. He was a ninth grader. Um, it was an example of what happens when kids are allowed, students are allowed to flex these problem-solving muscles in the service of learning content. And so. This class in Oakland was looking at poverty. Um, they were looking at economic development, um, social mobility. And this was a subject that this group of students had some very personal experience with. Um, the task, after looking really broadly at uh, poverty, at, um, at, at the framing of the issue, was they were to design a social business plan that impacted this issue in some way. It could be at the neighborhood level, local, um, statewide, national. They had their choice. And they could do it in whatever way they liked. Um, and as this student shared his plan for action, he, he cited his motivation, which was really telling about how students learn and connect with this material. And that was that his family had never been to a sit-down restaurant. Um, they had never been somewhere where they had been waited on um, by a waiter or waitress to serve food. Um, this was very much a luxury to him. His family had been on public assistance for all of his young memory. And so what he created when he was given this assignment was a concept for a restaurant staffed by individuals who were under or unemployed, um, who were trying to find stable jobs and livable wages. Um, the clientele would be families like his, who could make a reservation. They could register to be eligible to be patrons at this restaurant, and then they could apply food stamps to the cost of the bill. Um, and he had learned a lot about economic development initiatives and subsidies that were available in the city for um, economic improvement and revitalization in neighborhoods um, that were adjacent to his own. But Beyond just sort of the economic lens of studying poverty, what this student uncovered and what he helped the entire class learn through this exploration that began with his own narrative was essentially um, that the connection between that and dignity, that choice and dignity, it wasn't just about receiving aid or receiving money or economic assistance, but that dignity was so inextricably linked to effort to alleviate poverty. And so his personal lens on this and, and the ability to let him step into that and be creative um, and, and flex that ingenuity muscle was critical and, and the lesson stuck in a way that the delivery of content in a different way couldn't have. And what was also happening in that room was that teachers were learning alongside the students more about their insight into motivation, more about what um, sort of lit them on fire about injustice and inequity and then gave them a path. And so some of the things that we're seeing there that we talk a lot about in our work is how do we allow a space for choice and voice? So um, what does it look like to allow choice and voice in the classroom so that these global competence skills and dispositions can develop? And, and how do we create the intersection between those 
personal narratives and issues that have more broad implications. Um, using the community as a classroom is another sort of pivotal piece of this. Choosing something that can be seen, touched, felt, heard. Um, learning in this way um, gave a lens to these students to have um, sort of a much broader conversation about it. And then, of course, allowing students to take action, to put ideas into action. The third I want to focus on is, our, um, is really resilience. Um, this example um, comes from a group of newcomer students in Minneapolis public schools that we worked with who were at the earliest stages of acquiring academic English. Um, and they read the novel Sold about human trafficking. And so the novel represented, represented their own ability to be resilient. They had to work through some very complex, challenging text to be able to persevere. But it also represented interest in their life. So a lot of these students had um, personal knowledge, personal experience with people who had been affected by human trafficking. Um, kids stuck, stuck with the text to the end because they were interested in the material. And the content was so meaningful that the task was less than surmountable. So as a result of this, students asked a lot of deeper questions about the topic of human trafficking and started to dive in, found out Minneapolis was one of the hot spots um, for this in, in the world, um, and then decided to create um, essentially a series of brochures that gave basic information to people who may be at risk for human traffickers um, and or their families may be at risk for human traffickers and distribute them at places they had learned were um, were high risk for um, were, were, where people prayed. So sporting events was one of them. They read the book Sold, Joy. Um, so, so this was sort of another evolution of looking at, um, and I'll show you a copy of the cover. Um, oh, we're missing a slide. Sorry about that. Um, but this was another example of allowing students to do a few things. One is not just what we just saw, which is passion-driven learning that gave them some space to dive into. Yes, they had, they were applying um, reading strategies to complex texts. They were moving through what they had to in, um, in language arts, but they were also given um, leeway and leverage to be able to build something new. Um, so, so the other piece of that, though, is that it's important for young people who are building global confidence to also build advocacy skills. Like, how are they going to communicate this and persuade others? And so the activity allowed them to figure out how to take material and content that they had learned and position it in a way that would be persuasive to others. Um, so this was sort of an important piece of that. So now what I'd like to do is sort of in our last bit of time together, um, move into looking at some of the effective principles. So over 14 years, what are some of the things very high level that World Savvy has taken away from working with students, teachers, and administrators to embed global competence into, um, into teaching and learning? Um, so um, with that, I'm going to ask um, on the student element, we're going to watch a very short video. Steve, if you can cue the festival video to share with folks. I can, and I'm going to go back one slide. This was the one that was missing, right? Oh, that was the slide that was missing. Okay, so I put it in while you were yep. talking, and it will be in the recording as well this way. Okay. Okay, great. Let me get Thank the you. video queued up. So when this video comes up, folks, you'll need to click the play button in order for it to play. We'll bring you back. If you get delayed in any way, we'll put the link in the chat as well, and you can watch it uh, at another time. Here we go.
Thank you, Steve. Um, thank you so much. Hopefully um, you guys got to see that. I'm sorry if it was tough for some of you on the mobile um, on the mobile device, but um, we can also, I think um, there's a link to Vimeo if you couldn't see it, you can open in a different window. Thank you, Steve, for doing that again. Um, the reason I played that for you rather than just talking at you is, um, and Jim Zucchini, who I, I believe is in our, in our chat somewhere, runs this program, is it sort of exemplifies through the World's Heavy Classrooms model what we've learned about um, really great student engagement, sort of what does that look like, how does it happen, no, you don't go into a room and sort of dump a massive global issue on students and say, you know, figure this out, um, what is sort of, how is that scaffolded and structured. So it's a project-based learning model that allows a very big roomy theme um, to exist for students and for teachers. We do this in partnership with them, but then allows students a lot of choice and voice in determining how they, um, what they actually select, what topic they select that it's personally meaningful to them, and then walks them through um, a research process and then allows them a forum um, once they've developed solutions that we call knowledge to action projects to share them with the community. And then there is now an online platform where those students can collaborate with one another come this spring and also um, apply for funding to make their ideas a reality in the community. So some of what's happening there, what we've learned from that is that um, setting it up in a structure like that, the students you were just listening to and 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 sort of hearing from had this opportunity to, to be in, a, in, a, in an ambiguous space where failure was quite possible. There wasn't a right answer um, to any of the issues they were working with. That's a really uncomfortable transition to make um, when historically we've sort of been taught um, in K-12 or the way the model has worked to sort of there be a right or a wrong answer and a test that says, um, you know, our students that say, am I going to be graded for this, this idea that um, the process is key. And so the self-directed learning that happens in that program is critical. Um, there's also a big element of interdisciplinary thinking around this, that um, student engagement when it's happening across content areas and they can see um, things come to life, and I'll give you an example of that in a moment, is pretty critical. Um, that there's context for their personal and local experiences globally, and then empathy, humility, and reflection, which you've heard me talk about now um, ad nauseum. So um, next what I'd like to do is, from the teacher perspective, share a little bit of what, we, what we've what we learned is really effective. And so in the interest of time, what I'll do, Steve, is ask you to cue um, just the first, um, that first video of Maggie. Hopefully this works for you guys. This is also on Vimeo, and, and I can ask Steve to recopy it in the chat box as well if you watch it kind of separate. Um, it will give us a sense of, from a teacher perspective, how her practice has changed. And then I want to talk about a little bit of what's happening. And remember to click play. Thanks, Steve. And so what I want to do um, before kind of consolidating what we've learned about teacher capacity and practice, um, so um, it, it is not go to the next video, but skip that video and go to the one that has three people in it, um, to, to touch on a little bit of what assessment looks like. Um, that's one of the biggest challenges we find that people have is thinking about if you're not measuring it, how do you sustainably do it? And so three teachers from the Blake School in, in Minneapolis who looked at, who are teaching humanities, um, are, give, it, give us a sense of how they've embedded global competence into their grading. And so um, if we can, and I'm sorry if this isn't working for the vast majority of people, um, but um, they sort of get to talk, um, they will talk you through 
what how they've done I that. I think for the majority of people, it is working. Just those on mobile devices or behind okay. a firewall. So here okay. we go again. Sure I'll put the link in, and um, just be sure to click play. Thank you um, for that, Steve. And so if everybody's back, um, so you could see what was happening there and the reason I showed it is this is a really, really difficult piece, right? Um, you do what you measure. And so when we talk about world savvy and we talk about this matrix, these teachers really had this ingenious way of saying, okay, well, let's take our grade book, take the elements 
essence of the matrix that we want to, to look for and make that come to life. And so it's changing conversations in the classroom with students who have a different incentive structure for what they're learning. It's not just an, are we going to be graded on this? Are we, um, it's motivating in a different way. And so, um, I wanted to be able to share that with you. The next, um, sort of, and what's happening there, we're running a little short on time, and so I'm going to move pretty quickly through this um, in, as a courtesy to end on time today, um, is just the points that are probably very obvious. A huge shift for educators that we see doing this really well is becoming facilitators of learning and almost coaches, as you heard Maggie say, as opposed to thinking of it as delivering content or having to be masters of all of the subject or content or ideas that are shared with their students. So allowing themselves to let go and, and help students and their interests and their narratives and their own ideas drive what happens. Um, and then routinizing a lot of the opportunities for individual exploration and personal learning so that there's some sort of structured choice as students move through it. Um, and then thinking real, really critically about what assessment and evaluation means in that space. The, the last piece on the teachers that I, I want to think about is modeling this in our own um, teaching, it's hard to teach for global competence if we don't consistently build our own capacity for global competence. Um, this, and, and Amy, you bring this up in the chat room, we talked about this yesterday um, with a group of teachers in Virginia, is the idea is that this is really hard stuff. I'm challenged, we're in an election year, it's a great example. I'm challenged by, you know, if you feel um, very passionately about an issue, you feel very passionately about um, something that you, you, you're, you're sort of dislodging assumptions around that and opening yourself up to hear things is really, really hard. And so um, so that's a piece of it that we think about a lot. Um, the last piece I wanted to leave folks with, I don't know how many administrators are with us, but just to share a few of kind of the, the best practices of what we've seen in administrators. And Steve, I'm going to do this a, a different way to make it quicker, um, and then I'll come back to that video. Is There's two different kind of categories we've looked at. And, and, and I want to end on this for a particular reason, because it is not the job of educators alone to build a globally competent K-12 system. It's an impossible task for educators to do on their own. And so this idea of kind of systems change for global competence depends upon a more community-wide effort to do it. Um, we talk a lot about teachers, and so much of the responsibility seems to rest with them um, by default, but that's really not the reality, that this is, this is a, a this, this really does take a village. And so from the administration angle, what we've seen is that in the practice and in, in, um, in, in sort of routines arena, this idea of fostering openness in, in transparency and dialogue and actually intentionally creating space for it. So the idea that you can say you want a, global, a globally competent culture, you can say that those things are important, but if, if you're not literally opening up space for things that you can't anticipate, the conversations that might be hard, the complex issues that you'll encounter that need to be discussed with colleagues, the room for reflective and um, reactive conversations to what's unfolding day to day, um, that, that it, it means everything. If it's not there, then um, it, it, you can't have really, sort of you really can't have good, good, um, good conversations. I don't know if it's more or less comforting that this is a common strand in Holland as well, but, but, but it is, but, um, but it's really critical. Um, the other piece of it is more in that sort of policy and structure bucket. Um, one of the things we found working with districts is something we call a spray and pray model, where districts get very excited about global, but they sort of shoot things off in all kinds of directions without establishing some understanding of what do people think this is, whether it's, you know, world savvy definition of global competence or it's something else, how are they collectively understanding what that is so that they have some metrics that people, that people can agree on are worth shooting for and driving toward. And the other piece that's really important is this understanding of the baseline. So, Every educator in this room today um, likely suffers from initiative fatigue, this idea that it's, um, you know, it's exhausting to be pummeled with new idea after new idea. And for this to be an effective lens, administrators need to set up time to understand what value it already exists. Um, what are the things that can be leveraged? What are the amazing things happening in curriculum and pedagogy and community connections and ideas? Um, and they can often... Um, they can often undermine teachers who are willing and capable and excited of working towards these goals by not having a good understanding of that. And then literally and, and physically embedding them into the plans that matter from an administrative lens, strategic plan, operating plans, um, all, all of that. So, um, and then the final is engagement across stakeholder groups. Um, World Savvy has learned, and this is a very obvious thing, 
um, an obvious thing when you think about it, but it's surprising how infrequently it's done, that when you're building a plan for global competence, global competence by definition is inclusive, it's interdisciplinary, and involves a lot of voices. And so if a plan is developed by administration that leaves out voices of a stakeholder group, teachers most often are left out, parents, community, um, it, it, it shoots itself in the foot before it sort of gets out of the gate. And so I have a longer video. What I'll do is maybe see if we can just share the other. Our Vimeo channel actually has all these if you go to it, where there's an administrator, um, because we have to wrap up, that um, you can listen to her own reflections. She's a principal that's in Minneapolis that talks about um, her experience setting up the intentionality around routines and practices and the intentionality around policies and structures. And then if you're interested, um, to get in touch, we can kind of share more about our work. We do comprehensive partnerships with schools and districts that look at this in a very kind of systems lens. So um, with that, I want to leave you with one final thought. You guys have been wonderful. If not, the slide isn't on here, but um, it's essentially just a reminder to bring us all back together. Um, and I, I know that this is very obvious to everybody in the room, but we reinforce this all the time when we're talking to communities, whether it's parents or teachers, um, about this, which is that this is uh, global competence is not an endpoint. Um, so I've worked in this field for 14 years. I don't consider myself to be an expert. I'm on a journey where the lens um, that I am acquiring is um, making it making it easier for me um, to interact with new things that come into my path, to learn, to be reflective. Um, so if this is something that, as an educator or as a school, we're sort of looking at as a checklist as something that we can click through and be done with and move on to the next initiative, the effort will be shallow. And so I think really at the root, it's about a commitment that we all need to have, thank you, Steve, um, to, that, to that journey, to saying um, let's invest ourselves every day in, in that messy work and assume it will be messy and complex and learn what we can from it. So I, I talked a lot at you. Um, I had a few more videos to share and time ran, ran out, so I apologize for that. Um, but please be in touch. Um, um, I'll give you my email directly in the chat box right now. I'm absolutely happy to field um, questions um, and, and frankly, um, you know, challenges to what I've said, other things to think about, and especially people joining us um, from sort of the global community. Um, I would love to hear your thoughts on the applicability and, um, and how this resonates. So thank you all very much for being with me today. Thanks, Steve and Lucy, too. And Thanks, Lucy. Dana. Uh, I wish there were time for Q&A, but I'm going to clap for you, and I do that by hovering over the smiley face icon and then looking for the applause. It's hard to find, but anyway, that was delightful. Thank you so much. We are going to let people go. There Thank are a all. set of sessions, a great set of sessions coming up this the top of this hour, so Please do close this window and move on. We'll turn off the recording here, and this recording should be up on the site in about 15 minutes. Thanks, Dana. Thanks, thanks everybody. Okay, thanks. Hope you're having a great day. Bye.